He says, I didn't even go back to the clinic. It's unfair. I want the same advantage as others. An advantage that has spared so many in Uganda. Now the others must wait, but they could run out of time. In Uganda, they fear the old face of AIDS could return. Dave McKenzie, CNN, Kampala, Uganda. Well, the World Health Organization says HIV remains the world's leading infectious killer, but Uganda may not be the last country where major clinics routinely turn patients away. According to a recent report by the medical charity Doctors Without Borders, PEPFAR isn't the only donor to reduce its drug funding. UNITAID and the World Bank have announced reductions to drug funding in Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In addition, Kenya is suffering drug shortages and the number of patients able to start drug treatment has been trimmed in South Africa. It seems the golden window of Western generosity towards HIV and AIDS programs is closing. That has implications not only for Africa, but also for the world. Let's bring in Paul Zeitz. He's executive director of the Global AIDS Alliance. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Is um, you know, those examples we just gave there, they're rather depressing, but is that a true picture of the situation across Africa and other parts of the world, in fact? Yeah, thank you, Max. Uh, that is an excellent, accurate report of what's going on. Uh, we're in touch with uh, and partnering with African activists in many of those countries and other countries, and there's been a, a, a turning back of the commitments that were made from the international community, particularly President Obama and his government, on the commitments that he himself made during the campaign. And it's a tragic uh, setback on progress as you had shown, there was a lot of momentum, positive response, but uh, we're, we're seeing a slowing and a reversing of progress. And, you know, we hope that the blunder of that policy that Obama is uh, implementing can be fixed uh, still. We're focusing here on the United States because by far the biggest funder of this sort of work, particularly in Africa, right? Um, what are you saying in layman's terms about what the Obama administration has done in comparison with the Bush administration? You're saying they're basically putting less money into it or they're not increasing the money? What are you saying? Well, I mean, as you, as you reported, President Bush announced $15 billion over five years, and then Congress actually provided more than what Bush asked for. They were providing $25 billion over the uh, first five years of the initiative. Obama, Clinton, and Biden during the campaign all committed to increasing the spending by at least a billion dollars a year throughout the course of this uh, first term. And unfortunately, when they came into office, they reversed that uh, intention. And they uh, only, they basically essentially flatlined. There's been very small crease, increases in funding. And they also cut funding for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which is an international partnership where the U.S. provides one-third of funding and leverages funding from other international partners. And that the Global Fund is funding programs in all those countries that you reported on. This is your new reality, though, isn't it? Because every country in the world, in the Western world at least, is cutting back on all sorts of types of spending. And this is one area, foreign aid, where unfortunately... Um, the, the same applies as all the other areas of government. So this is your new reality. Well, I, I'm not quite sure about that. I mean, as you know, uh, the U.S. government, President Obama, released his national security strategy on May 27th, just a few weeks, a month ago. And in that, he talked about development, diplomacy, and defense. And we've seen dramatic increases in de uh, defense spending and uh, trillions of dollars being spent on the financial bailout for Wall Street and uh, the gap on funding that the U.S. committed to provide. This is not what I think is actually needed. It's, but what Oba President Obama said he would provide is several billion dollars. It's not that much money in the realm of what they're putting out for other priorities. So Obama has lost basically the integrity of his word. And that is a serious uh, threat to his credibility and the credibility of the United States. And African uh, stakeholders uh, are grieving at the loss of his leadership. They're shocked. Uh, but now it's moved into like a troubled phase. We're troubled by his failed leadership. And 
This uh, just, isn't. Just very quickly, I'm, I'm before speaking, uh, we, uh, we, yeah. ha we have to uh, move on, but just very quickly, uh, the Obama administration, nevertheless, is by far the biggest funder of this very good work, and uh, uh, to write it off completely would be rather negative, wouldn't it? It's just isn't, he just isn't able to increase the funding as much as you would like. Well, the AIDS response that you re reported on was like an airplane that was on the ascent. The effort that you described took years and years to create. When you, when you stop funding it, you're like chopping off a wing of an airplane. And so the momentum that uh, uh, creating the kind of program response on the ground that Dr. Mugenye and the people that you were talking about uh, refer uh, is being lost. The ground that's being lost is very severe and Obama has a chance to fix that over the next several months and we're hoping that he looks at this issue and, and fixes his policy. Okay, Paul Zeitz, thank you very much indeed for bringing us your thank perspective you. on that. Now, one athlete involved in the AIDS awareness cause is Kobe Bryant. The basketball superstar might not be the most obvious guest at a soccer facility in South Africa, but the Nike complex also offers AIDS education, counselling and testing. It's part of an effort to combat the disease in a country with the world's largest HIV positive population. Of course, HIV and AIDS awareness are global issues, as we've been saying, and Sunday was National HIV Testing Day in the United States. The Center of Disease Control estimates that a quarter of a million people living with HIV or AIDS in the US are unaware of their status. Up next, a new beginning from a year of tragedy. In our latest iList special, we focus on how Poland is redefining its future with a focus on innovation, technology, and investment. Stay with us. We're new every day. All the stuff we run hasn't been seen before. We want to show you the stuff you didn't see anywhere else, but maybe you should have seen. Samsung introduces the world's first 3D LED television, a new dimension in TV. Each month we've been showcasing a nation's people and places focusing on what shapes a country's economy, culture and its social fabric. We began our iList series in France where one of its trendiest cities, Marseille, is getting a modern makeover, opening a window to its younger generation. Then we headed to Bahrain. Its new international circuit is a drawing card for motorsports fans in the Middle East. In Georgia we looked at the revival of fortunes of the port of Batumi. It has an ambitious plan to restore its status as the city for trade and tourism in the Black Sea. In May, we travelled to Macedonia, where one successful winemaker has been bringing a Napa Valley twist to the country's ancient vines. And this month, the iList team is in Poland. After a year of disasters, including the plane crash which killed its president, Frederick Pleitgen takes a look at how its economy may be turning the country's fortunes around. Polfarma is Poland's largest producer of...